the limit as n goes from 0 to infinity, and you do the next term, right? So what's, what do you replace with what to get the next term? Yeah, so you replace n with, yeah, so that's the next term, 2 to the n plus 1 plus n plus 1, and then you're dividing by the current term, so you just flip it over. Yeah. Everybody's okay with me doing this? I'm not have to write it, don't have to write it twice. So what is it? It's 2 to the n plus n over n plus 1 times x to the n. Nice. Anything simplify there? Yeah, what can you do with that x to the n? What happens? Just becomes x on top. Nice. So let's write this out. What do we end up with? We end up with from 0 to infinity, we have n plus 2, and then you have 2 to the n plus n like this. And then you have, let's just write it a little differently, 2 to the n plus 1 plus n plus 1 like this, and then n plus 1. All I did was rearrange it. Now, why did I do that? All I did was rearrange it. I didn't, I just changed the order. That's it. So, oh, times x, yes. Times x that is key you're right <laughs> so i did that because i wanted you to look at this what does that go to as n goes to infinity what does that part go to the yellow part that goes to one now the next part is really key here this green part see this green part everybody you have to be very careful about this which terms don't really matter there what terms really don't matter inside the green the one the plus one doesn't matter right what else doesn't matter the n's don't matter because 2 to the n and 2 to the n plus 1 get way bigger than n, right? So really you're looking at what happens here. What happens here? What, hap what does that go to? That goes to 1 half. So what does this whole unit, what does this whole limit go to? 1 half what? X. X. So if that is what the limit is, the ratio test says that it has to be less than 1 for it to converge, the absolute value of that. So what's the radius going to be? The radius is... 1 over 1 half. Do you remember? It showed you this in one part in the book where it's the coefficient of x. It's whatever's in front of x because it's less than when you divide by 1, right? Divide one into, it into 1. So the radius is going to be 2 on that one. That would be totally fine for work right there. That would be totally fine. But see how I use color there to very explicitly say what each thing went to? The key thing is realizing 2 to the n gets way bigger, way bigger than n. So you're really looking at this limit here. The limit as n goes to infinity of 2 to the n over 2 to the n plus 1, what does that equal? That's 1 half. That's where it comes from. And then there's another one here which reverses it. It has 2 to the n plus 1 on the numerator and 2 to the n in the denominator, so it goes to 2. So if that was 2x instead, what would the radius be? 1 half. Exactly. Now you don't have to test the endpoints because it's only asking you for the radius of convergence. This, knowing the radius doesn't tell us where the interval is. Where could the interval be? We could figure it out based on this, but if I just told you there's a series, the radius of convergence is 5. Does that tell you any about anything about where? No. No, it doesn't. Okay, anything else from the homework? Raise your hand. Everybody. You do the next term, n equals 0. So it's the limit, not the sum. Sorry, did I write? Oh, by the way, this was not supposed to be sum. What is it supposed to be? Limit as n goes to infinity, yeah. So what do we have here? The limit as n goes to infinity of the next term, 2 to the n plus 1 plus n plus 1 squared times x to the? And we're dividing by which term? The current one. So it's 2 to the n plus n squared x to the n. Is this very similar to the one we just did? Yeah, that cancels. What are you left with on top? Just x. And then you look at this one right here. What terms don't matter? Or what terms, I'll, I'll rephrase it, what terms do matter on this in the, red, in the blue? Yeah, this matters, right? And what does that go to as n goes to infinity? 2, right? And this just goes, they negate each other. So what do you end up with? What's this limit? 2x. So therefore, what's the radius of convergence? One half. That's all. It's the same exact thing. It gets flipped over. Same exact thing. Yes, Gary. What if it's two, two to the n over n squared? Two to the n over n squared? Yeah. That would be infinity. Or would it be infinity? Which one's bigger? <laughs> that, so basically, you're asking this. You're asking this question right here. So which one's bigger? Yeah. You're asking this question. So you have to be very careful about this. As n goes to infinity, what happens <laughs> if you had this right here? What form is that? What form is that? You, have to, you can't just say it. You have to actually do it out. There's one thing we can do to attack that limit. Anybody remember what the method is? Take the tail of n plus. To what? 
You could. You could. There's another thing you could do. Begins with an L. Limit comparison. Nope. Oh, ratio. Ratio. Uh, you could do the ratio test. What else could you? We're not asking whether it converges or not. Remember, go back to limits. Go back to AB calculus before you got to this class. There was something you could do. Sir, I just you said you could do the ratio test. Isn't that asking if the sequence? That's exactly what I just said. You can't use it. Yes, yeah, so you can't use it. So the question is, there's a there's a methodology we covered already in this class in 7.7. L'Hopital's rule, is that an indeterminate form? Why? Why is that an indeterminate form? It's infinity over infinity. What happens as that n goes to infinity? 2 to the n goes to, and so does. So what do you do to both the top and the bottom? You take the, the derivative. What's the derivative of 2 to the n? Someone raise their hand. No one say it. Someone, what is it, Jerry? Close. Yep. Yes. The derivative of 2 to the n is ln2 times 2 to the n. And what's the derivative of n squared? What is it? 2n. And this is, this is state of this. Is this still an indeterminate form? Yes. Yes, it is. As n goes to infinity, what does the top go to? What does the bottom go to? Is it still an indeterminate form? Can you do L'Hopital's rule again? Yes. That's what this h means, do L'Hopital's rule. So now it's the limit as n goes to infinity. What's the derivative of the top? ln2 what? Squared, 2 to the n. But what's the bottom become? 2. Is this an indeterminate form? No. What does that equal? Infinity. That's how you prove it. You would show that that's how you would use L'Hopital's rule to prove that. Yes, you would use L'Hopital's rule to prove that. Yes? Yes. D, dx of ln a is equal to, sorry, ddx of a to the x is equal to ln a times a to the x. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. 100%. Let's do something. We're going to transition here. Let's say I had a function. You ready? Here's a function. Whee! Like this. Okay? It's traveling along f of x. And I'm going to say that, let's say, I'm going to pick a point here. I'm going to pick the point right here. See that point right there? If that point right there, I'll put the arrow below it. If that point right there has an x value of a, what's the y value? What's the y value? F of a. What's the slope at that point? Someone else tell me. What's the slope? Just given the notation on the board, what's the slope at that point? Yep. Correct. What is the form of a line that I want you to use by default? What's that form of, what's the general form of a line I want you to use? That is a great thing for you to say out loud because it is not what I want you to use. Which is, I want you to use the other one. Point, slope, point, or slope, point. All right, which one? What is it? Y, yep. Exactly. You just went with one. I didn't give you enough information to go on, so it's totally acceptable. I like this because you don't have to do a little bit of extra algebra that 1% of you will mess up, and I will mess up. If I don't force you to put it in slope intercept form, don't. You're going to have to in this case, but I want you to start there. So if that's the form I want you to use, what's the equation of the tangent line? So if this is the tangent line right here, here's the tangent line. Can someone tell me what the equation of that line is right here? What's the equation of that line? You have a point and a slope. Can someone tell me what the equation of that line is? Someone who hasn't spoken yet today. Nam, what's the equation of that line? Y minus what? Nope. Oh, excuse me. No, y minus f of f of a equals yes times x minus a. Yes, exactly. So if I wanted to write that in slope intercept form, which we're kind of okay with because we took algebra one and they forced us to do that over and over again, what do you end up with? Y is equal to f of a plus what? f prime of a times Everybody okay with that right there? We just found the equation of the tangent line. That tangent line tells us lots of things. If it was a roller coaster, we could use it to find instantaneous velocity, right? When you're in the neighborhood, there's this term in math called neighborhood. Neighborhood sounds really weird and imprecise, but it actually is a word in math, neighborhood. When you're really close to that A value, like inside the green, is the tangent line a pretty good estimate of the function? If you're close to that point, is it a decent estimate? Theoretically, is the tangent line a lot more simple than the function itself? So for, for values around the a value, and if you didn't need to be exact, would that tangent line be an acceptable replacement? The rules for that estimate were it had the same slope, 
at the point. And what was the other rule for finding that? It had the same slope, but it also had the, the same what? Same what? Same derivative. It had the same rate of change there, right? Same derivative, meaning it's a line. It has one rate of change. Now here's the thing. The blue part of that function right there, is that a straight line? If you zoom really far in, does it look straight? Sure. But this part of it right here, is that straight right there? Is it curved? What's the simplest curve we know? What's the simplest curve we know? What? Parabola. So here's the thing. What did we just do? We just found a tangent line that estimates the function for that neighborhood. And it works because it goes through the point and it shares the same first derivative. We're going to do the same thing right now, but instead of sharing the first derivative, it's also going to share the second derivative. Second derivative. Do you agree with it? It's going to share the second derivative. So before we do the general case, let's look at a specific function to show you what I mean. I think doing a specific case and then looking at the general case is helpful. What function is, and I think I labeled it, so it's going to be a little easy to figure out, but what function is that, <laughs> that red? I've already labeled it. What is that function there on the board? What's the general quadratic? General <coughs> quadratic. Okay, so if I take the first derivative and then the second <coughs> derivative, are you okay with those first and second derivatives? If I take the first derivative, the two drops. If I take the second derivative, oh, two a. Okay, that's nice. Are you okay with that? So let's go over to the function itself. What is, before I do these right here, what's the derivative of cosine? What's d dx of cosine of x? Negative sine of x. So what's negative sine of 0? Zero? 0. And what's d dx of negative sine of x? Negative cosine of x. So what is negative cosine of 0? Negative 1. Are you OK with that? <laughs> We're good? We, we believe in some trig right now? So what did I say? We're finding the parabola of best fit. And there were three things. It has to go through the same point, 0, 1. It has to have the same what? First derivative at that point, slope. And it has the same second derivative, right? Did we just find? OK, so we know it has to go through 1, right? So when cosine is 0, this function at 0, what was the original function? Oh, what is h of 0? Just c, right? Because what happens when you plug in 0 right there? What happens? They all go to wait. What's the only term that's left? So what does c must be? c must be what? 1. Are you OK with that? OK, what's the first derivative come out to be? The first derivative, plug in 0, you get b. Do you see that right there? Plug in 0 right there, what happens? 2ax, what happens to it? Goes away. So what does b must, what does b must equal? 0. b must equal 0. And then the last one here, what's the second derivative? 2a. Well, it's 2a when you plug 0 in for x. It's still what? Is there any x there? It's always 2a. So what does this become? 2a becomes what? Negative 1. What was our general quadratic? ax squared plus bx plus c. So what does this general quadratic become? It becomes this. There's no b, the 0x, everybody, because b was 0. So what is our parabola of best fit? This right here, you could call the parabola <coughs> of best fit. And what does that look like? If I did the graph of this, which I pasted in right here, what does the blue represent right here? What's the blue represent? That's cosine. What's the red? Yeah, y equals negative 1 half x squared plus 1. Is that a better estimate for a larger part? Yeah, it's pretty good actually, right? So here's the thing. Was the horizontal line an OK estimate? Sure, for a little bit, right? Was this a better estimate for more? Yeah. Yes. What could we do to create a polynomial that's an even better estimate than the par parabola of best fit? What could be the next thing we could find? We could find the? Cubic of best fit, right? And then we could find the, what could we find next? Yeah, remember what the fourth one is? What's that called? Quartic of best fit. We could find the quintic of best fit, right? But here's the thing. How many times does cosine oscillate? An infinite. So if we wanted to find one that models like all of cosine or a lot of cosine, what degree could we go to? We could go to an infinite degree. 
we could go to an infinite degree. And here's the thing, I'm pretty sure most of you are asking in your head, like, what the heck is the point? Because how hard is it to write down cosine? C O S X. That's really nice. And you're telling me I've got to break it apart into this huge, huge, huge series. And I'm going to say yes, because sometimes these functions, you run into a wall, you break down the wall into a million little pieces. And what can you do with each of those pieces? Oh, they cancel out or you do something really nice with them. They go away. What's on the wall of the math resource center right outside? E to the pi i plus one is equal to zero. zero. You're going to learn how to turn this. <laughs> You're going to learn how to turn that into an infinite series. And guess what happens when you plug in pi i? It turns into negative 1. Super cool. It's totally true. And it like blows my mind every single time. It's like the coolest thing in all of math. It really is. I know it's all subjective, but it is. I'm right. OK. So let's go back and look at the general case. Let's go back and look at the general. A bit more general. Instead of starting with the quadratic, what would I need to start with, Chip? Instead of the quadratic, we start with the, what's next up? Cubic. So let's call that j of x. And instead of squaring at the first term, it would be a cube. So you'd start with this. And then you would find, what did we do first? We found the derivatives. Any, what's the first derivative of it? j prime of x, what's that? 3ax plus 2dx yep, plus c. Nice. The second derivative, oh, I don't know why I converted it to y, but that's unfortunate. What is j double prime? That's going to be 3 times 2 times 1ax plus 2 times 1b. Anything else? <laughs> nope. And then what's the third derivative? Oh, I did it again. What's the third derivative? 3 times 2 times 1a. Yeah, 3 times 2 times 1a. And then you're done, right? Because the other part's a constant. Why did I write it as 3 times 2 times 1? Because it's factorial. I wanted to show you the factorial. Because if you started with, I don't know, n of, not n, that's a bad one to choose. Let's say I started with p of x as some general nth degree polynomial. What's it going to come down to? What is p, the nth derivative of x, going to be? n factorial a, what the leading coefficient is, right? Does everybody see that so far? And when you plug in 0, lots of things cancel. If you do out the general form of that, I wanted to show you where that comes from. Here's what the quadratic comes out to be. Here's what the quadratic comes out to be. This is the Taylor polynomial centered around what number? Zero. When you get to choose where to put these, because theoretically you can tack the Taylor polynomial anywhere, what's a great number to tack it to? Zero. They're called McClure polynomials. Zero is great because it's nice to plug zero into things, right? So if you do that, look what we did there. f of zero on our last one was one. Remember the negative x squared, negative one half x squared plus one? It has to go through that point, right? But then it's the first derivative times x evaluated at 0, the second derivative of 0 over 2. It's really not 2. What should be next to that 2? 2 factorial. Because what do you think the cubic, if I wanted to make this, we, we found this. Our first example came out to be negative for that specific one. Remember this? If we wanted to do the third degree, it's going to be the same thing right here. But what do we add to it? What do you think we add to it? What's the next term, Soma? What do you think the next term is? Yep. Yes, x to the x to the third. Exactly. That would be the third one. It's very, very, very numerically oriented. There's no skipping so far. You fill in the blanks. So when you get to choose, choose zero. You're sticking it at that zero. Now here's the thing. You make this more accurate by adding on more what? More terms. Remember alternating series, you add them together, they get more accurate as you add. Same thing here. Add more terms in, they get more accurate. The general term you need to remember here is this. See this? That's the general term you need to memorize. That is the coefficient of the x to the n term. That is the coefficient. You have to memorize that. Take 30 seconds and memorize that right now. Siemens calculus test. Find the <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. Usually, where does the end start? When do you start using this instead? Usually, like three or four. Could you start it anywhere you want? Yeah. Sure. Generally, it's three or four. Please don't use more than three little tick marks, okay? So take 30 seconds and memorize that for me, please. Take 30 seconds. What's the degree? Seven. So how many, how many derivatives do you need to find? Seven. Is it real? You need to find seven derivatives here, seven derivatives. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seven. 
So you're doing this all the way until you get x to the seventh power. Is it really easy to get the derivatives wrong? Even when they're easy like this. So when I did this out, for example, I, I started skipping things. Like for example, on that chart right there, there's something missing. What's missing? <laughs> the what? Uh, nope, before that, what's missing? <laughs> okay, do you see the function f of x? Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of f of x? f prime of x. Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of f prime? f double prime. Do you see f double prime? Yeah. No, so I did this one out many times, skipping what? The second derivative, is that kind of important? Yes. yes, because it moves all the other derivatives, right? So you have to be really careful. Why are sine and cosine, or in this case cosine, why is cosine a really nice function to use with, this, with uh, Taylor polynomials? If you're taking seven derivatives, why is cosine really nice? It loops, it's cyclical, right? What happens if I gave you something, are all derivatives cyclical like that? No, they're not. Sometimes do derivatives get horrible? Yeah, sometimes they go to zero, and that's nice, right? But what happens if, what happens if they don't? They get really big really quick. So I put in the image here just so you could see it. I put in the image here just so you could see it. So the first thing you do, if I ask you for the seventh degree Taylor polynomial around zero, you have to find seven derivatives, and you have to evaluate all seven of them at what? Zero. We're centering it around zero. Do you have to center it around zero? No. no, you could center it anywhere you want, but given the choice, where do you center it? As long as zero is in the domain. Is zero always in the domain? Could you center the polynomial at zero if zero is not? No, you can't. So if it's in the domain. So look at that. Are these the right derivatives? Yeah, they're right. So then what do you do? We're doing it around zero. So what do you do next? You plug zero in, and you get all of these things, right? So do you remember what the general term is? It's the nth derivative evaluated at zero over n factorial times x to the n. n. So what do we do here? Let's just do them right over to the side here. So the first term is just f of 0. What is f of 0 in this case? 0. And then we're adding to it f prime of 0 over 1 factorial times x. So what's f prime of 0? What's 1 factorial? Times x to the first. And then what's the second term going to be? f double prime of 0, which over? 2 factorial, what's f double prime of 0? Yeah, 0 over 2 times x squared. So is that term going to go away? Yes. What's the next one going to be? f triple prime of 0 over 3 factorial x cubed. What is f triple prime of 0? Negative 1 over, leave it as factorial, x to the third. Oh, is this one comes out to be 0, do you agree? The next one, the fifth power, what does that come out to be? Oh, it's going to be 1 over 5 factorial times x to the fifth. And then this one is 0. And what's the next one? Negative 1 over 7 factorial x to the... So which terms are we left with? We're left with this one, this one, this one, and... When we put them all together, what do we end up with? We end up with this. Sine of x is equal to approximately what? It's, well, it's x. Is the, remember, this is 0, so it's x plus what? x minus 3 factorial x to the third plus 5 factorial x to the minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the Exactly. That is the seventh degree Taylor polynomial approximation. So if we graph that, is it going to look like sine for a while? It is. It's going to look like sine, and then it's going to go, boo, it's going to go off because a seventh degree polynomial ends up looking like this. Does this oscillate forever? No. no. So it's good for like seven turns, right? Or six turns. Because how many turning points does x to the seventh have? <coughs> six turns. So it's good for six turns. Not bad. How would we make it better? You'd find the, the ninth, tenth of. Now here's the thing. Let's look at this just to give you a preview of what's to come. What do you think the next term is? Raise your hand when you think you have the next term. Chip, what is it? Zero. No. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Yes. The eighth degree term would be zero. So what's the next term that you would actually write there? You're absolutely right, Chip. I'm sorry. Ian, what's the next term? Plus 1 over 9. Exactly. 9 factorial x to the 9. Exactly. So that's, it, it, it is that. Because sine it nicely cycles. There's a nice pattern to it. So the Taylor polynomials, three of them you're going to have to memorize. What do you think one of them is? Sine, cosine. Anybody know what the next one is? E to the x. E to the x is actually nicer. It's really nice. But those are the three like core. Those are your core vowels for Taylor polynomials. They're super important. So look, hey, did we get that? Nice. It's near zero. That's really cool. Oh, I'm so happy. So happy. So happy right now.
What's the only thing I've added in right here? What's the only thing I've added in in this blue box? What's the only thing that's new? Near A. It's near A instead. So does this change the formula at all? Not so much. What did you memorize before? You memorized when A was what? So now instead of 0, you can plug in any number you want. And what does it change about the term? Instead of x to the n, it makes it x minus a to the n. That's it. Can you center these things anywhere you want? Yes. And sometimes you have to move it. Sometimes you do. When do you have to move the Taylor polynomial off 0? I told you this. When do you have to move it? When 0 is not in the domain. When 0 is not, okay, no, no, not in the domain. domain. So for example, that's the example you're going to do on your own right here. So everybody find a piece of the board with somebody you're not sitting next to right now. And you're going to do this one right here. When you do this one out, the first thing you need to do is write the function derivatives and then evaluate it at 1 each time. So you should end up with 0, 1, negative 1, 2, and negative 6. You should end up with those as your derivatives. So when you put it together, instead of x to each power, it's x minus 1. So it starts with 0. So it's 0 plus x minus 1 minus x minus 1 squared over 2 x minus 1 cubed over 3 fact. Oh, with the 2 and the 6. Oh, very cool. Some of you missed some things here. What did you miss? There are certain things that are missed. Anything get missed? Oh, look, some things cancel here. You can simplify because you have this 2, the 2 cancels. So you simplify a little bit. On a test, I would accept either this line or this line. Like, what's the advantage of the first line for me? What does the first line show me? Yeah. And you know the polynomial. Exactly. You know the polynomial. The second line is cleaner. But only a little bit cleaner, right? Just a tab. You're canceling like the two and the three factorial. Yes. Chad, do you have to equal zero here? You have to equal zero. What do you mean? Do you have to equal zero there? Uh, I would really like you to write this to begin with. Okay. It's really easy to miss the wrong terms. It's really easy to miss the wrong terms. I would love to see both of these lines, honestly. I would love to see both of these lines. You guys, I can guarantee you're going to get lazy at a certain point and start missing, skipping things, and then when you put it all together, guess what's going to happen? You're going to like miss the second derivative of cosine, do all this work that's correct, but with the wrong derivatives, it's just going to get not good. It's just going to get not good. It's not going to get not good. What if we don't simplify all the way? Like, so Great <laughs> derivative. What did you get for your general derivative? The nth derivative turns out to be what? Okay, n, factorial. n factorial 1 minus x to the negative, negative n. So what is, when you, what is fn of 0? It's just n factorial, right? It is n factorial because when you plug in one, what's one to any what's zero? Sorry, what's one to any power? What's one to any power? One. One, one to any power is one, right? So when you write this out, remember it's f zero plus f prime of zero over one factorial x plus f double prime of zero over two factorial plus f three zero over what? Three factorial all the way up to fn at 0 over n factorial x to the n. Sorry, x squared, x cubed, right? But here's the thing. What are all those? 1 plus 1 factorial plus 2 over 2 factorial x cubed, right? Plus what? x squared. Thank you. x. I'm missing the x's here. You have x and then what? x squared. Oh, and then what's the next one? 3 factorial over x cubed all the way up to n factorial over n factorial x to the n. What cancels? All of them cancel, right? So what did you just show? 1 over 1 minus x is equal to what? Oh, and the first one is what? Is it 1? It is. 1 plus what? Plus, plus, all the way up to? That is only true for certain values of x. Can you tell me off the top of your head which values of x that's not Stephen, what values of x this is, works for? This is true. This is an infinite series. This is true. Does it work for 7, the number 7? Yeah. If x is, no. 7 plus 49, that's not equal 1 over no. negative 1. No. What numbers does it work for? You can do it. Zero. It works for 0. What else does it work? Yeah, true. You answered the question. What type of series is this? Geometric. Geometric. What's the ratio? X is the ratio. So the ratio has to be less than 1. So the absolute value of x has to be less than 1. So this converges when x is between negative 1 and 1. Try 1. Does 1 work? 
<laughs> so you plug in one here. No, and what's one plus one plus one? Oh, it blows up, right? Does negative one work? No. No, it oscillates. So it's all the numbers between negative one and one. This is true. That's pretty cool. Also, you can prove it like this. Cross multiply this. What happens? If you cross multiply, all the terms cancel except for one. And what are you left with? One equals one, which is one. true. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a good Wednesday.